Hi, my name is Noreen Dunnett. I'm one of the e-learning consultants that works with schools in Barnsley and Sheffield. And I'm just going to give this a little bit of context before we start. I've always been very interested in games and learning. In fact, I'm doing a doctorate on it at the moment. So any, anyone wants to volunteer their pupils for that research, that would be wonderful. Um, the context of the work that Simon is doing at Holy Trinity um, was that I had a personal connection with a company called Teacher Gaming, who um, have a product called Minecraft Edu. And what you're going to hear about today isn't Minecraft, it's Minecraft Edu. If you haven't heard of Minecraft, which stone have you been under? But if, in case, all right, Minecraft's about breaking and placing blocks in its sort of uh, crude form. It doesn't even look very fancy, does it? Um, but the Minecraft Edu version is an educational version, as I said, modified by a Finnish company called Teacher Gaming. And it has teacher controls, which enable you to control what the students are doing. Um, and create a, an environment for learning rather than a purely entertainment environment, although you want them to have fun as well. Um, so today's case study that you can hear about um, is based on some workshops that we did last June with Teacher Gaming. And uh, it, the purpose of that was to improve motivation uh, in writing with reluctant writers, many boys, was it? Simon uh, or it, just it everybody? It did, did it, in the end. <laughs> Uh, if you're interested in anything that you hear today, um, Simon's contact details are there and mine as well. We can talk to you a bit more about that. And we're hoping to set up somewhere in the room uh, a couple of laptops with Minecraft Edu so that if you're interested, you can have a little play on that. So do find us later in the day and have a little play. Over to Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so as Noreen said, um, <coughs> I'm an English teacher. Um, but I'm also a dad, and my, he was eight at the time, eight-year-old son, um, was absolutely fascinated by a senior shed. Um, stamp along those, introducing one of his videos in Minecraft. Um, he's followed by his subscribers, total, I think, 5.2 million subscribers on YouTube. And he's just passed three billion YouTube hits that's three billion individual views of his Minecraft videos. He uploads a 30 minute video every single day. Imagine EastEnders going out every single day. That's the kind of content that he puts out. That's him. Yes, he does, he still lives with his mum. I think I tried to work out the revenue on a quarter of a million YouTube hits per week. And it works out at something like $4 per thousand sponsored hits which works out at astronomical money. But he still lives with his mum. Good on him, I would. <coughs> so my eight-year-old son started building things that he'd seen in Minecraft. He started playing around with different worlds. One evening, it went very quiet. And when I went into the living room to see what he was doing, he was sat with a notebook and a pen. And he sat writing down what he'd just done in the game. And I thought, wow, that is, that's unbelievable. He, in his big writing lessons on a Friday, I've seen his book and he struggles to get more than three or four sentences done. He'd written two and a half sides of this story. And I thought, well, flipping heck, if it's gonna work for him, why can't I do it in my lessons? So I started looking into Minecraft Edu. As Noreen said, Minecraft's a game in essence, about building with blocks. It's Lego in a digital format. There's a growing community all over the world using Minecraft to build all sorts of different learning environments. Maths teachers use it to build area, volume, ratios, all sorts of different things. It's got real in-game physics built in so you can actually do experiments where you drop things to see how long they're gonna to take to fall. You can jump off the top of things to see how long it takes you to hit the floor. <coughs> you can time how long it takes to ex make something explode. You can see how far it flies when it explodes. Some of the more gifted Minecraft teachers um, around the world have created actual internal organs that students can fly through they can explore an actual model of a heart. They can get inside it and see the valves. They can see the chambers. They can read signs about what the different parts do. 
A couple of upgrades back, Minecraft added redstone, which is, in essence, wires. Now, my son's got a world. It's got a house. And when you press the doorbell on his house, a bucket of lava drops on your head. The floor opens up. You fall through a puddle of water and into his hallway. The redstone it took to do that goes all over the place. He's worked out how to get the and, or, and not gates, and the delays in the switches to make it so that you get dumped with lava, and then a second later, you drop through the floor, through this water. I couldn't do it. Nobody sat him down and said, you need to put this here, then you need to do it. He's worked it out for himself. He's found it out on, in on the internet. He's gone on YouTube. He's Googled it. People have built full working computers in a Minecraft world. <coughs> it's global. I'm connected at the minute with teachers in Hawaii and Japan, all over the place, sharing worlds, sharing experiences. Students can do exactly the same thing. Some of my favorite uses of Minecraft involve setting up citizenship scenarios. So you put students into two different villages and you give them a finite amount of resources. Eventually those villages are going to connect, but one's going to be very rich in trees and wood. One's going to be very rich in sand. They need to make glass, so they have to combine. They have to work out the trade relationship, how much is wood worth compared to sand. They need both to be able to create glass. So they have to negotiate. <clears throat> the top left picture, the top left image, I used with my wife runs a guide unit. Um, and our older girls were learning to navigate. They were getting ready for their G uh, sorry, Duke of Edinburgh award. They just couldn't visualize maps. They couldn't visualize the ups and downs of contour lines until I showed them a Minecraft world. And they absolutely got it, that all the blocks of one color are on one level. Ordnance Survey, they've taken the entire map of the UK and turned it into 22 billion blocks in a Minecraft world. It's just under two gigabytes. And I got a message from the systems manager saying, I'm sorry, Mr. Badley, you've uh, exceeded your download limit for this month. Can you please not do that? So I had to download it at home. One of the absolute best worlds in, in the Minecraft Edu community is a humanities teacher in Hawaii. And he's recreated some of the most iconic moments in history. So you can fly through an Egyptian pyramid. You can explore Greek temples. You can pretty much visit. If you can think of it, he's got it in his world. It's absolutely amazing. So, my little bit. For me, it had to be learning first. Yeah, I could think of a million different things that I would want students to do. Fantastic. But the key question is, how would that help them with their writing? How would it help them read? If I can't answer those two questions, I can't do it. I don't want to do it. <coughs> so I came back to the image of my son sat with a sheet of paper, writing his two sides of story that he just played. And I thought, to him, that's, that's got to, there's got to be a reason why he doesn't like writing in class but he absolutely loves writing about Minecraft. So the first thing I did was I set up a story land. It's just an ordinary blank Minecraft world. And I put a floating library above it. Each of the pods have little teleport blocks in the bottom of them. So a student walks across a certain area and they're transported to an experience zone. So they spend sort of 20 minutes or so exploring this zone. They could, be <coughs> they could be underground in a haunted library, reading books in chests to find out what's happened 
to the owners of this library. They could be on a desert island that's been laid siege to by pirates. And they spend about 20 minutes exploring this zone. They then return back into the central library. And one of the things that Minecraft's got built into it is editable books. So students can actually stay within the game and write their story. They can write the story that's just happened to them. The other thing I've found that motivates students is when they get a problem, they go away and find out the answer. I've got a stack of these Minecraft books. I'm sure you've seen them if you've got Minecraft kids at home. But they'll come out of the game, they'll pick the books up, they'll start reading to find an answer, they'll get on Google, they'll get on YouTube. They're absolutely reading for a purpose. <coughs> I can't actually show you Storyland because uh, it's saved on the school, the school server and I had to find something that I could bring with me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you through very quickly uh, an in-game experience. Now hopefully this will work. So when you launch Minecraft Edu, and the thing that absolutely sets it aside from Minecraft, it gives you a server tool. And the server tool allows you as a teacher to control absolutely everything within game. <coughs> I can decide whether it's going to rain. I can decide whether it's going to snow. I can decide what time of day it's going to be. I can turn the monsters on or I can turn the monsters off. I can allow students to hit each other or I can stop them from hitting each other. If they've gone to the far corners of the map, I can press a button, freeze every single student in the game, and two clicks later, they're all standing next to me in game. Absolutely, the, the, the key thing about Minecraft Edu is it makes it an education tool. It's not just a game. You as a teacher are absolutely in control of that experience. So the service one part, and then there's the client. And there's two different ways to access Minecraft Edu. I've got the server running, and hopefully I should be able to connect. If any of you use Minecraft, you can connect to servers that are hosted by companies, and they, they take a certain fee off you per month. This is not the same thing. Nobody can access this server unless they know that specific string of numbers. Within school, we've got it set up as a static server, so that num those numbers never change. Once the clients know that server, they connect to it every single time. But students can't connect to it from home. I've got absolute control of when they use it and how they use it. Students will access it as a student, which means the teacher that's logged on controls everything that they do. I'm going to log in as a teacher. My apologies, sorry. It's not going to, it's not going to let me show you the world. Um, but what you should have been able to see was a world that's built at, at the top of Mount Everest. And the scenario is um, the polar ice caps have melted, the sea levels have risen, and humanity's escaped the earth. And students wake up in a hibernation chamber. They've been asleep for 200 years. They don't know what's happened, but there are clues left behind. There are things left, by, left behind by the scientists that created this station. So as they're exploring through the world, as they're exploring through um, the first parts, but as they're exploring through the world, there's story blocks placed at strategic points that give them key information. The first couple of times I ran it, students just raced through as fast as they could. They were clicking on the blocks, but they weren't really paying that much attention. So I created a little case file with a set number of questions and as they're moving through this, um, this underground research facility, they're finding the answers to these questions. They're absolutely reading for a purpose. It doesn't feel like a task, though. It doesn't feel like a job, because it's part of the game. It gets over that work factor. And I spoke to my son about writing, and he said, it actually feels like work, like washing up or doing the gardening. 
It's not something creative. Writing's hard. It's a task. But the first time he played this world, he just he forgot that he was writing and just did it because he wanted to get to the end of it. And I usually say things like, the first group that gets to the bottom win a diamond pickaxe. The things kids will do for a diamond pickaxe is unbelievable. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable. The next stage when we go Office 365, when that rolls out, that's going into OneNote so that I can have the students collaborating, working together in this project in real time on their machines. We're getting Office 365 within the next few weeks or so, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to adding that particular section. Um, I can show you, and as they start to look round, they notice that there's chess. And the first thing students do is strip the chess completely bare, absolutely take everything, and then run as far away from each other as they can. But what they don't realise is that all these are red herrings. They don't need food because they're not going to get hungry. One of the game um, features is that when they play it at home, they get hungry. And if they get hungry, they get hurt. We can turn that off, and we do. So they don't need any of this food. So while they're all scrambling around, give me that, I want that, no, 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 right. They're in the game, they're immersed within the world, they're talking to each other. The only thing they need is a shovel and a pickaxe. Because as they start to explore the world, they need to do certain things with it. These blocks are specific to Minecraft Edu. And when you click on them, they're story blocks. That can have as much text as you want, or as little text as you want. So if you remember, we've got the case note. And students were trying to find out all this information. They absolutely have to, oops, they have to read. They have to do a little bit of maths. It's 200 years later on. Right, got it. They're reading for a purpose, but by this point, they're immersed within the story. They're immersed within the scenario. One of the biggest problems with motivating readers is how do you motivate them to want to read? How do you motivate them to want to write something? And teachers all over the world use photographs, we use poems, we bring things into the classroom, you use an app on an iPad. This is another way of immersing a student and motivating them to want to do some of that work, some of the washing up, some of the gardening. So they spend the time exploring this part. The story's built up. So by this time, they've worked out some of the things that have happened. They haven't got a full picture yet. They've had to start collaborating with each other. Right, so what, what's the next thing we need to do? Where do we need to go next? Um, I'm not going to take you through the entire storyline. One of the great things about the teacher tools is, while all the other students are stuck to the ground, they, they can jump, they can walk certain places. I can turn myself into, it's called build mode. So it means that I can go anywhere. So I've got an overview of everything that students are doing down on the ground. I can see where they're going. I can freeze Barry because he's got stuck halfway up the cliff and he's just about to burn in lava. Uh, I can teleport Sally into the middle because she's lost and she's in a little hole and can't find herself. But I can also fly through blocks. The first thing students will see when they come outside is a spaceship. And the story evolves so that they've got to find enough iron to build this spaceship, to send a message to the people uh, that are off the planet that Earth is now safe to return to. Um, but there are no trees, and the people won't return until there are trees. So underground somewhere, I can't quite remember where the tree is, but there's one tree remaining. And students have got to find that one tree. And if you can imagine exploring this sort of thing, there he is, look. When you destroy a leaf block, it gives you a sapling, one potential tree. And students bring it back to the surface, they plant the sapling, and that grows into a tree. 
and they repeat the process. So one tree will give them two saplings, let's say. So they plant those two saplings, the two saplings give them four. So they have to work out how long... I'm not going to touch it anymore. <laughs> <coughs> they have to work out how long it's going to take them to repopulate the top of Mount Everest with trees. But they also need to use the wood from the trees to create tools. They need to use the wood from the trees to melt the iron and get it out of its ore form and into iron ingots so that they can turn it into this spaceship. So they've got to collaborate. They've got to balance the needs of planting trees so that people will return back to Earth and create a forest with usable resources. <coughs> By this point, they're in the world. They're there. They are the character. It's not like you're making Mario jump around on the screen. They are the character. It's them. It's a first person. It's multi-sensory. They can hear things. They can touch things. They can break things apart. They can build whatever they want to build. They're completely immersed. The writing that comes from it, which is absolutely the most important thing, can be just about anything. I've done probably five or six different writing tasks. We've done stories about what happened to all the trees. We've written scientific reports from the point of view of the scientists that built the rockets to let um, humans escape. We've written diary entries of, um, from the point of view of the last people left on top of Mount Everest. <laughs> I've even lost my mouse now. There we go. So I'm going back to the... <coughs> this was one student who really, really, really struggled to get more than a couple of sentences down. Um, and I just literally gave them what happened to the trees. Some of them wrote a newspaper report. This particular student wrote a, a short story. Um, the, the skills that they've displayed were always there. They were just not using them. They weren't motivated by progress. They, so what? I don't really care. So it's my job to make them care, to make them want to write something, to make them want to put pen to paper and actually get something done. And this particular task we did like that. We wrote it down first, and then they typed it into the books. <coughs> this student was underachieving. They weren't performing up to their potential. But by immersing them in this world, by giving them that rich experience that they could draw from, by putting them into that situation and then telling them to, telling them to write about that situation, they had real things, they had concrete things in their head that they could draw on. They were so immersed in the game, the writing didn't feel like work. It got past that. And they produce things like that. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, anything that can go wrong with technology probably will go wrong, as I've clearly demonstrated. And I think during lunchtime we're going to be set up on the table in the corner so you can come and have a, a hands-on if you want to. Thank you for your patience.